there you go. And um, and I will make sure I send everybody the, the link after um, probably early next week. And all of the recordings are now at the Sergeant Memorial Library YouTube channel. So if you want to revisit them, they are right there. So today's topic is about John Singer Sargent. And um, we have Jane, the wonderful presenter here. She is the founder of Culturally Curious, an arts education consulting firm specializing in art appreciation programs. She curates and delivers programs throughout New England and beyond. Hold on, I'm meeting another person. Um, she holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. And she was born and raised in New Hampshire. She has worked at some of the state's most esteemed culture institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. So for more information, you can go visit IamCulturallyCurious.com, which I will put into the chat uh, box in a minute. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Jane. You are welcome to um, either leave your video on or um, I get distracted by myself, so I turn off the video, but I guarantee you I'm, pulling, pulling, uh, I'm paying full attention. So Jane, take it away. All right, thanks so much, Pajan. Thank you everybody for taking time out of your day and probably time out of your vacation, your holiday vacation, to uh, spend it with me and to learn a little bit more about John Singer Sargent and really to indulge and revel in these extraordinary images. John Singer Sargent's paintings, I think more so than anybody else I can think of, are just gorgeous. Like they are delicious to look at including this one that we have on the screen. Every time I start this program, I always feel a little underdressed. <laughs> like, shouldn't we all be in elegant evening gowns right now? So just a quick preamble before we get started tonight. Um, I think a lot of people in the greater Boston area feel really connected to Sargent. Um, I know that I do. I sort of feel like the beginning of my career was almost like following him around a little bit in Boston. I was in college when uh, there was the big summer of Sargent, the big exhibition at the MFA, which was over 20 years ago now. But, um, but seeing that show was really galvanizing to me as a young person because those images were so beautiful. Shortly after I graduated from college, I went to work at the Boston Public Library Foundation where our main goal was to raise funds to restore the Sargent murals. We'll be getting a peek at them tonight. And then I, um, I also became a museum teacher at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and his work is very well represented there as well. So here I was just, you know, a young 20 something just kind of chasing him around. So I feel this really kind of deep appreciation for his work and a deep connection to it as well. So it's an honor and a pleasure for me to share a, a little bit about what I've learned along the way with you tonight. So we are looking at just a detail here. We'll zoom out for a moment of the Wyndham sisters to get us started. Uh, this very large painting, almost 10 feet high, which is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, was painted in 1899. And John Singer Sargent was really at the height of his powers. And we can see really what he does best here. We're looking at essentially the, um, the playbook for like a great Vanity Fair co covered these days, right? I mean, people wearing gorgeous clothes. Um, and, and sitting around, not really sort of interacting with each other or touching each other, but in, in, in visual ways, they are clearly connected. In this case, like I said, they are sisters. They were considered so beautiful, so elegant when this work was first um, exhibited that uh, a critic set, referred to them as the three graces. And John Singer Sargent does something really sort of interesting and maybe even a little bit innovative with this work. We can see that he really only uses the bottom half of the canvas to portray these women. And for the most part, he's really just using, you know, ivories and whites and a little bit of like gray and beige to describe these gorgeous dresses that they're wearing. And then the rest is this kind of shadowy background here. But what he's done is is, um, he's included portraits or even like the vaguest reference to portraits of these women's um, uh, uh, their, of, of their 
their ancestry. Really, it's their mother and then other ancestors beyond them. So really kind of rooting them in a social class <laughs> by, by doing this. And, and so with this picture, we get so much of what Sargent is great at. There's a little bit of in, in innovation. There's certainly a lot of virtuoso brushwork. And then there's just this overwhelming elegance that's just so beautiful to behold. So let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll move through to uh, the material for tonight. We're going to start off with an introduction to the artist. We'll keep it kind of brief. And then I sort of frame him as a cultural chameleon. He moves all around Europe and we'll see that he's kind of uh, trying out all of these different styles and sort of identities as an artist. Uh, then he sort of settles on this grand manner portraiture that we know him best for and having friends in all the right places really kind of catapults his career. And so we'll look at a number of his portraits and then some of his major commissions. We'll take a quick peek at his watercolors and end with his legacy. Now, I have on the screen here my very favorite John Singer Sargent portrait. This is Lady Agnew of Lucknow, painted in 1892. This is at the National Galleries in Scotland. It's just too gorgeous to pass up. It didn't really um, neatly fit into any of my categories tonight, so I have her here. I think this is a, such a great example of his painting because this is a woman who can level you with her gaze. So there's something really sort of enchanting about her face here, but then once again, the way he painted this skirt here and this huge lilac ribbon that is sort of draped over the edge of the chair and just these big, broad brushstrokes that are uh, still provide the illusion of this very elegant dress. It is mind-blowing. I read just a year or so ago that, that this woman here, Lady Agnew, um, was actually very sick when her portrait was being painted. So this, this look of confidence that I've always sort of um, pulled out of this particular portrait might just be a look of weariness in somebody who actually just wants to go to bed. So I think for many people, they are are attracted to Sargent's paintings because of, um, you know, these gorgeous dresses, the beautiful women. And we could spend the entire night looking at those works, but I felt like they would take us a little too far away from the story of Sargent. But whenever possible on a title slide, I've dropped them in so that we can really appreciate that virtuoso brushwork. This is Mrs. Henry White. She's at the National Gallery of Art, painted in 1882. And we've got this great quote from Sargent, the thicker the paint, the more it flows. And so we will be seeing how he uses paint to create this illusion of, of, of certain really high-end fabrics. And, and, and of course, in this case, he's, he's painted this woman to look absolutely statuesque, surrounded by gold. Who wouldn't want to look like this? We should all be able to resurrect John Singer Sargent to paint our portraits for us today. So let's get started with an introduction to the artist. We can see him over here as a young boy, probably around the age of 11, with his sister Emily over here on the right, age 18. John Singer Sargent, was born in Florence to nomadic ex expatriate parents. He and his family traveled throughout Europe throughout his childhood, and he and his siblings were really exposed to some of the world's best museums, um, the, the biggest, most grandiose uh, churches and cathedrals. Uh, Sargent was educated by his father, and he was fluent in English, French, Italian, and German. He received some instruction in drawing and watercolor, from his mother. And in uh, by the time he was a young man, he was accomplished in art, music, and in literature. That almost makes me want to pull my kids out of school and just travel to Europe right now. Now, as a teenager, he began his formal art education in Italy. But in 1774, when he was 18 years old, so he was born right around mid-century, he and his family moved to Paris so that he could receive the best of the best training. He was accepted at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which was the premier art school in France. They had a very rigorous program in terms of drawing drawing and anatomy and perspective, but he did something else in addition to um to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, he began to study under an artist named Carolus Duran. And we can see him over here in a photograph and, a, and an example of his 
kind of painting. Now, Carolus Duran was um, really different from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. You don't go and study with him to learn anything about drawing or perspective. He was considered a modernist, really. He was like in the same vein as like Manet at this time. So what Sargent learned by, by working with Carolus Duran was really um, this, this novel approach to painting, which was called a la prima. It's, it's this idea that you go directly to the canvas with a loaded brush of paint and you just start going. You're not working on, on, on the underdrawing or the underpainting or anything like that. It's really about wet on wet painting. So, um, so this was, uh, this, the, this accomplishes this kind of broad painterly style that we see and we really associate with Sargent in particular. So you really get the illusion of like a silk shiny silk dress here in the Carolus Duran uh, painting. And so he's mastering all of these materials and the, and the aspects of, of a portrait that would make somebody look particularly lovely, alluring, elegant. And of course, you've got your sweet little dog here too. So there's a lot to be learned here. And when Sargent was really done with his studies under Carolus Duran, he creates a portrait of his master. Now we're so lucky because this portrait is here in America. It's at the Clark Art Institute in Western Mass. It was painted in 1879. Sargent was just 23 years old when he painted this. What were you doing when you were 23 years old? Now, um, he paints his master in this kind of casual pose, but with very elegant clothing. We, he looks like a, sort of a dandy, a man about town here. And he is wearing this little red pin uh, signifying the French Legion of Honor. And that was an award that he received for his contribution to the art. So he's honoring him in so many ways. Notice the, the realism, the attention to the face in particular here. But beyond that, the brushstrokes get, um, they, they, see, they, they get more buttery, they get broad, they get painterly beyond that. So there there's a, a realism here and then sort of like a glamour shots fantasy to all of this as well. Now, Sargent inscribed this painting um, to his master here, signing it or describing himself as his affectionate pupil. So this is an homage to his master and also a statement of his newfound independence from him. This was a man who was essentially graduating and coming into his own. Now, what we'll see with Sargent is there's always a critic. So here's a little cartoon where somebody's criticizing his portrait of Carolus Duran, essentially for making him look a little too devilish here. Now, what we know about Sargent is that he goes on from this, um, from this moment in his career to have a, an incredibly successful life in the arts, primarily with portrait painting. So we see John Singer Sargent over here in a self-portrait from about the age of 20, and then another self-portrait from about 30 years later. And you you can really see how this early style that he adopted um, really gets polished up and we get this incredible sense of, of um, the immediacy of the realism of the sitter here but then once again his ability to make his sitters his subjects look so elegant so um, so aristocratic in so many ways so John Singer Sargent has a nearly 50 year career he paints about 900 oil paintings during this time, 2,000 watercolors, and in addition to that, uh, several major mural cycles. We'll get a, a, a peek at them, and along the way, he has his fair share of controversy, too. Now, like his parents, he remains an expatriate for his for essentially his entire life. He's, he's very well-traveled. He never settles down. He never gets married, and he never has any children. His life is his artwork. Now, he does have close ties to the city of Boston, and I'm sure many of you are, are tuning in tonight from somewhere near Boston as well. So you've probably seen some of his work at the MFA, at the um, Boston Public Library, and of course at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. He was good friends with Isabella Stewart Gardner. We, here we can see him painting a portrait in her Gothic room um, on the top floor of the museum. And this is actually a portrait that's in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts. This is Mrs. Warren Fisk and her daughter, Rachel. Another elegant portrait. We can see the artist at work over here and then sort of an outtake uh, blurry face here where he turns uh, turns back towards the cameraman kind of laughing. Now, when it comes to Sargent's career, he becomes a little bit of a celebrity himself. And in, um, in these cartoons, these caricatures of her, him, we can see that he becomes larger than life. <coughs> 
excuse me, he was a man who was known to appreciate a good steak and a good cigar. And yes, he had sort of an expanding waistline a little bit later on in his life, but cartoonists all, always made it really big. <laughs> I think the, the bigger his stature was in the art world, the bigger he got in cartoons. Sargent lived till the age of 69 and died of cardiovascular disease in his sleep. So we have a sense for like the greater arc of his career. Let's zero in now at the beginning, what he does after he comes out from underneath his master, Carolus Duran. This is a painting that he did um, just the, uh, essentially the same year as the portrait of his master. Uh, this is Madame Ramon Subercasso. And we can see that still he is leaning into this idea of thick, heavy paint um, on, the, on the paintbrush in order to deliver this kind of virtuoso effect here. I love this color blue. And he's also certainly delivering on creating a, an astoundingly beautiful portrait of a lovely young woman in a stunning dress here. So no small dabs of color. You want plenty of paint to paint with. So this idea of a cultural chameleon. Sargent moves around quite a bit, especially over these next few years. And he is sort of... Um, plucking out different elements of different styles, experimenting with them, adopting them as his own. But one of the first places he travels to after he finishes his studies is Northern Africa. This is a picture that he created while he was in Tangiers. He was 24 years old. Now, this is another painting that we're lucky to have right here in New England. This is also at the Clark Art Institute. It's called The Smoke of Ambergris. Now, um, the ambergris is, um, is, is essentially something that you would put into a sensor like this, um, ignite and then inhale the fumes that come from it. I encourage you to Google search what ambergris is because it's a really kind of disgusting amalgamation of things that you would pull out of the ocean. <laughs> But it was it was thought to have it was thought thought to sort of be um, an aphrodisiac in terms of its smell. Now, what we see with this picture is Sargent kind of taking on the subject uh, a subject that would seem especially exotic to his um, European um, audiences. So he's uh, he's showing us essentially the patio of a little rented house that he had it while he was in Northern Africa, and he's dressed up this model here wearing clothes that were um that were specific to the region here too. So people went crazy over this painting for a number of different reasons. I will tell you that one unidentified critic said, uh, it's quite simply a perfect piece of painting. Um, Henry James said, I know not who this stately woman may be, nor in what mysterious domestic or religious rite she may be engaged, but in her plastered arcade, she shines in the Eastern light. She is beautiful and memorable. The picture is exquisite, a radiant effect a white upon white of similar but discriminated tones. So he touches on what really makes a picture like the shine, that it's essentially a white painting. And this was all the rage in the second half of the 19th century in certain circles in Europe, um, introduced by the artist James Abbott McNeil Whistler, who, um, who created this kind of knockout painting in the beginning of the 1860s called uh, The Little White Girl or Symphony in White. And from then on, artists were sort of challenging themselves by reducing down their color palette to um, essentially whites and ivories and grays. You can imagine what a challenge it would be if I handed you a box of essentially white crayons and said, make me a matter masterpiece. It's kind of showing off here. So from white on white, Sargent goes to inky black. And that is because from Northern Africa, he travels to Spain and he's really inspired by the old masters. So we're going to get back to this painting, which is in the collection of the, the Gardner Museum. But I just wanted to give you a sense in terms of the kinds of images that would inspire a really dark painting like this. Sargent was going to places like the Prado in Madrid, where you see these old paintings by the artist Velasquez, uh, where he's like layering black uh, uh, clo clothing on black clothing, but still making it distinct from each other. This is as challenging as doing white on white. And Sargent was up for the challenge. So here, here we see his 
early masterwork, El Haleo, painted in 1882. Sargent was 26 years old when he finished this. It's about 11 and a half feet wide. This really is a knockout painting, so much so that Isabella Stewart Gardner, who was just um, housing this painting for safety, it belonged to a relative of her husband's. Once it was in her possession, she redesigned her museum around it so that this would essentially be the first work that you saw when you walked in. Of course, there's been additions since then, so it's not quite the same experience. But whenever you stand in front of this painting, it captivates you. So what are we looking at here? We are, of course, looking at a flamenco dancer who's standing in the foreground at this dramatic diagonal with her arms um, almost looking like they're sort of bent backwards in this uh, dramatic moment of dancing. We can see other dancers uh, waiting in the background for their turn, perhaps uh, artists, uh, 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 guitarists and singers in the background. People used to always um, look at this figure in particular when I was giving tours of the gardener and wonder about him. Kids always thought he was sleeping, but he's definitely our singer here making the loudest noise possible. Now, before we get into some of the details here, I wanted to draw your attention to some of the mysterious elements back here in the background of this picture. John Singer Sargent, while he was in Spain, had the opportunity to go into caves where prehistoric man had been painting on the walls. And he was so taken by what he saw there that he added little elements, little suggestions of that experience with a red bull over here and a red handprint. These were the sorts of prehistoric um, images that he was seeing on, on those cave walls. Now, something else that he did on the back wall of El Haleo is he's added text, um, the words, ole, ole, repeated a number of times over here. So one of our favorite things to do as we were giving tours of the gardener, me and the other museum teachers, was to really talk about how this was the loudest painting in Boston, how you would hear everything from the guitar to the stomping of her feet to maybe even castanets, certainly that singer. And you could imagine all of these figures screaming out, ole, 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 all along the way. So this noisy, wonderful painting, like I said, still makes an impact today. Sargent moves away from the black very quickly though, because within the space of a few years, he's over in France and he's sitting and painting with none other than Claude Monet. I mean, this is a guy who gets in good with all the right people. Imagine being able to just sit down and paint with Claude Monet. This was done in 1885. Um, the painting that Claude Monet is painting over here on the left is actually, um, it's been identified and it's in, um, it's, it's in, well, I should say that Sargent's painting is at the Tate Modern. And over here, this is Claude Monet's wife who had accompanied them. Now, John Singer Sargent was so proud of this work and really probably proud of the fact that he got to hang around with Claude Monet, really like the leader of the Impressionist movement, um, that, he, um, that he doesn't abide by an old artistic tradition. Typically when two artists are working together side by side like this, and they paint each other, they would then go and exchange the paintings as like gifts to each other. But I think Sargent was so proud of this moment that he kept this painting for himself. Notice that he is adopting the impressionist brushstroke, these really quick, short, visible, broken brushstrokes um, that Sargent, that uh, of course Monet is using over here on the right to great effect. There's still some black in his composition, but for the most part, the, the impressionists were using more like a pastel uh, color palette. And so so um, over the next few years, Sargent certainly brightens up his color palette and he uses more of these broken brushstrokes. So th this work is from um, two years later. Uh, this is called Two Women Asleep in a Punt Under a Willow. This is Sargent's work over here. This is a work of the same year by Claude Monet. It's simply called The Boat. In both of these pictures, we have these boats um, receding into depth at this uh, dramatic diagonal, uh, surrounded by, by plant life and vegetation that is described with these short impressionist brushstrokes. Sargent never really fully moves away from depicting beautiful people in beautiful places and beautiful clothes. So, um, so that's a real sort of point of departure for him from, um, from Claude Monet. One other really famous painting that he did while he was working in this kind of impressionist vein is uh, 
this work of another artist, Paul Helius, uh, sketching with his wife. This is from 1889, and it's at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Once again, notice that the faces, that the hands are described with a fair amount of realism, but when it comes to the tall grasses, you can just see um, Sargent using all of this very loose, almost wild brush strokes here. Now, it doesn't end here. Sargent continues to travel, and he continues to be influenced by um, really, you know, different countries, different national styles. And this painting here, it always takes my breath away. It's called Carnation Lily Lily Rose. It's from 1886. This painting, believe it or not, got sort of a mixed reception when he first exhibited it. And some critics called it a Frenchified style, but I'm going to argue for you here that this is not French at all. This is Sargent sort of burrowing into the traditions that existed in painting in the UK. So of course, what we're looking at here is this um, lovely kind of twilight image here with these two innocent young girls in their white dresses uh, lighting up these Japanese Japanese lanterns. And so there's this kind of glow in the air. There's all this attention to the flowers surrounding them and the tall grasses that they're standing in. Now, to me, this doesn't look like an impressionist work or like a, a French painting at all. Instead, it reminds me of the UK tradition of this of pre-Raphaelite artists who were really kind of obsessed with um, with the deliberate uh, depiction of, of the natural world. And you can see that in this pre-Raphaelite work over here by um, Sir John Everett Millay from 1852. This is called Ophelia. It's depicting um, the, the famous character from the play Hamlet. And even as she's drowning here, your eyes are still pulled to you know, the tree and the roots and the trunk over here, the flowers, the tall grasses. And I think you get a similar effect with um, Sargent's carnation, Lily Lily, rose. Now, in order to achieve this twilight kind of um, lavender uh, hue of the day, what he was doing, he wasn't working on, on plein air in the same way that, that he had been while he was working with Claude Monet. Instead, he would work on this painting for about three minutes a day when the lighting was perfectly right. So he'd be out playing tennis with his friends. He'd check the time. He'd run and go over to his easel, do a little bit of painting, and then get back to the party. So this was a long sort of um, laborious painting for him. And it caused him much consternation, so much so that I read once that instead of calling it Lily, uh, Carnation Lily Lily Rose, he was calling it Darnation Silly Silly Pose. That sort of stays with you. So let's turn our attention now to some of his famous portraits and how having friends in all the right places just see, serves as this catalyst for more and more um, great opportunities to paint the rich and famous. Now, don't you love this quote? Um, the idea that a portrait is a painting with something wrong with the mouth. You sort of get that sense with this lovely portrait over here. This is Mrs. Hugh Hammersley from 1892. This is also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, in addition to this really interesting face of hers, actually one critic enthused, the head literally vibrates with life. Never has the spirit of conversation been more actually and vividly embodied here. I, I mean, that's a lovely uh, idea. But in addition to all of that, you have this astounding dress. And all of us here looking at this dress right now know exactly what that material is. You can practically feel it on your fingertips. She is wearing velvet and he has painted velvet in this completely virtuoso style. I mean, if we really kind of um, <laughs> try to uh, pull our minds away from our eyes for a second, we can kind of dissect it and see these broad brushstrokes that are you know, white and gray on top of this red dress. It's really astounding to me how he pulls off this effect. But in the end, of course, not only is the face interesting here, I think this, this sort of effect of her hand moving across the back of the couch too is so fascinating. He really makes for a great portrait painter. Now he had um, sort of all the right elements in place in order to be successful. He was smart, he was multilingual, multi-talented. He did all the work himself from start to finish. And he had a great personality and a great work ethic. So he could converse with these people who were sitting for his portraits. In addition to this, 
he had this confidence. Um, people were attracted to him. This is a little cartoon of all the ladies lining up at his London uh, studio in order to be sergeanted. This is a, a little cartoon from 1910. Now, just to give you a sense in terms of how successful he was, he could make about uh, the equivalent of $130,000 in today's money off of just one portrait. And he could paint about 14 of those portraits a year. So he was making the equivalent of more than a million dollars every year just off of these portraits. So it's leading to all the right places. He painted several U.S. presidents. Here we have Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson. There's a great story about him staying in the White House in order to paint Teddy Roosevelt's portrait. Roosevelt was not interested at all in posing for him. There was like a little bit of a squabble between the artist and the president and Sargent sort of chasing after him, trying to get him to just like sit still. And apparently Teddy Roosevelt turned back towards him, put his hand on the Newell post here and said something sort of um, maybe a little bit catty and indignant. And, and Sergeant said, no, hold that pose. This is exactly how I'm going to portray you over here. So then he goes from the White House to the largest private residence in the entire US. This is the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina. And Sergeant was hired by the Vanderbilt family to portray um, the architect and the landscape architect of the Biltmore Estate. So this is Richard Morris Hunt over here and Frederick Law Olmsted over here on the right. And of course, uh, how the, the elements of, of the setting for both of these portraits really portrays who these men are are and, um, and what they're best known for. Um, these are older men, uh, more, uh, uh, Hunt in particular was not in great health. And so the criticism here was maybe that Sargent paid a little bit too much attention to the architecture in this fountain that he's leaning on more so than the man, but still I think really astoundingly beautiful portraits of, of, um, of these very ad admired and successful uh, uh, creative types here. Sargent created another portrait of of Claude Monet, in this case, uh, a profile portrait. This is a self-portrait of Claude Monet from 1886, Sargent's portrait from a year later. You can see that he's departing from Monet's um, really sort of rapidly executed, broken, visible brushstrokes. He's moving more towards this kind of fluid brushwork that, um, that seems a little bit more realistic. I love that he shows him in profile here because it reminds me of like an emperor or a president, somebody on a coin, it's really a way to, con uh, to uh, convey how prestigious he thought um, Claude Monet was in the art world. He painted another leading artist, and in this case, it was the sculptor Auguste Rodin world famous for his thinker statue that we see over here on the right. The portrait of Auguste Rodin, I think, really sort of stands out to me in all of Sargent's portraits because uh, I get the sense that, that Rodin has this great sense of humor, that he's about to make this sort of wry joke at this very moment. There's a little bit of an arch to his eyebrow, this kind of thick beard here. He looks like such an engaging character. Now, Sargent could really give anybody a, a little bit of a glow up as the kids say today, can make them look really good. And he does that in particular for Henry James. This portrait was painted in 1913, um, just after the, uh, the author had been uh, nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. Now, just to give you a sense in terms of what Henry James really looked like, <laughs> we can see that the maybe Sargent's portrait uh, doesn't uh, effectively capture his likeness, but it certainly makes him look like a distinguished gentleman here, somebody who is deserving of our attention and respect. Another important author that Sargent had the opportunity to paint, um, another big star in the literary world, was Robert Louis Stevenson. This is um, a painting from 1885. Sargent was still pretty young here. It's in a private collection. And here we can see Sargent was still kind of experimenting. This is actually a really strange painting. So here we have the author, he, this tall, skinny, lanky man um, who looks like he's fidgeting, like he's nervous, like he's pacing, and he's just become aware of our presence. And then his wife over here is actually cut off by the edge of the 
picture and she's just what is she doing she's sitting in a chair she's got like a scarf over her head she's not looking at us it's and then right here in the center of the picture we've got an open door to this shadowy um, hallway in the back it is a very unusual format and composition here but I give Sergeant credit he's he's really trying to experiment you can see here in the comparison that his portrait of Robert Louis Stevenson is uh hits the mark maybe a little bit better than his portrait of Henry James now another great painting an early painting for Sergeant where there's a great deal of experimentation for better or for worse is his portrait of the daughters of Edward Darley Boyd this is from 1882 and I think it's a favorite for a lot of people who visit the MFA in Boston now um you can imagine <laughs> if you had a portrait done, a very large scale portrait painted of your children, you would want them lined up like school picture day, looking their absolute best and their most angelic, right? That's how you would want to remember your children. But Sargent is doing something really different here. He's essentially giving us a really great study of the different stages of childhood. So in the front, we have this little girl maybe she's four or so, three. She's guileless. She's curious. She's totally innocent. She's engaging with us, the viewer, as she probably did with the artist as he was painting. Um, just beyond her, we have another child. Maybe she's seven or eight. She's interested, but she's a little bit more reserved. Look at her pose and posture here. And then standing in the shadows, we have these Vis uh, visually and emotionally inaccessible girls. They are disinterested in the process. They are our classic teenagers, right? <laughs> they don't want to be a part of this. Um, and so, so even though Sargent has painted these four girls, he has not painted them in, in a way that I think most parents would expect a formal portrait to look like. Now, um, if you've been to the to the MFA, you've probably seen the installation of this painting with those huge um, porcelain vases that are featured in it on either side. Apparently, somebody told me that um, that they listened or they were a part of some sort of uh, conversation about the history of this work. And apparently those vases have traveled back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean, something like 30 times. It's amazing that they're still in one piece. Contemporary critics thought that Sargent spent too much attention uh, or put too much attention on the vases themselves. So here we've got a little cartoon where it's all vase, very little girl. <laughs> but in years since, um, this painting has been championed by art historians and even compared to uh, the masterwork by Diego Velasquez, Las Meninas, the picture of the little princess of Spain, the Infanta, who is here front and center engaging with us, the viewer, much in the same way that um, the little girl is in the Edward Darley Boyd uh, painting as well. So there's some, there's some inventiveness here, but this doesn't compare to the hot water that Sargent gets himself into when it comes to Portugal painting. He once said, every time I paint a portrait, I lose a friend. So let's touch on a few of those scandals. They're always fun. This is Dr. Pozzi at home, a very early painting for Sargent. This is right after he's done studying under Carolus Duran. He's 25 years old. This is his first large portrait of a male subject. Now, Dr. Pozzi was a leading gynecologist in, um, in France. And, um, Obviously, a very handsome young man, uh, very highly respected. Now, instead of showing Dr. Pozzi looking like the professional that he was, here he is in a photograph, John Singer Sargent chooses to portray him in like a house coat, essentially a bathrobe. And the painting is dominated by the color red. I remember when I first set eyes on this painting at the MFA during the summer of Sargent, I immediately imagined that this must be like a cardinal in a church, but there's something much more sensual happening here than a religious painting. In fact, Sargent is suggesting that this bathrobe could essentially fall open at any moment and notice how Sergeant or how, how Dr. Potsy here is sort of fiddling with the house coat right here at the chest. He's got these long, elegant fingers. He was very well known for those. But then his house coat or his robe is um, is tied shut at the waist with this uh, red rope. And notice how his
his other hand is really sort of hanging off of it. You could almost imagine the rope untying and, and you know, his body, his form being revealed underneath. Notice too where Sargent places these tassels. I mean, all of this is very suggestive, very erotic, very charged. But none of this compares to the sensation that was caused by his painting called Madame X. Um, Sargent painted this in 1884, just two years later. It's essentially the same format. If you saw these works together, the MFA in Boston during the summer of Sargent, they were right next to each other. They're like a perfect match in so many ways. Now, Sargent created Madame X when his subject here was 25 years old. He was 28 years old at the time, so still such a young man. What a profound accomplishment for him. Now, uh, Madame X was also known uh, by her real name, Madame Pierre Gautreau. She was another American expatriate living in France, and Sargent, like every other artist alive in France at the time, was very interested in her. She was sort of famous for being famous, famous for being a real sort of striking, unusual beauty. So much so that other artists describe themselves stalking her like a deer. Everybody wanted the chance to paint her and Sargent won that opportunity. And he spent the better part of a year um, visiting her and sketching her and trying to find sort of the right pose to embody her uh, her unique appearances, her really sort of stunning appearances. Now, apparently <laughs> she wasn't the easiest person to work with. Um, Sargent said it took all this time due to what he described as the unpaintable beauty and hopeless laziness of Madame Gautreau. And a lot of these sketches are her just like lying around on a sofa, probably what most of us have been doing since um, <laughs> since this past weekend. So that didn't make for a great model or, or very striking pose to say the least. But eventually um, using various media, we can see that he works his way up to this composition that he becomes really fond of, a standing Madame Gautreau uh, leaning up against this little table, wearing this incredible dress that has this kind of sweetheart neckline to it, uh, emphasizing this tiny waist that she has. And of course the finished picture here, the dress with the two straps here um, and and um, being a floor length gown, all of this sort of almost lavender white flesh here, and then her really kind of striking profile. Her arm is uh, sort of twisted backwards. It sort of reminds me of El Haleo that we saw from the Gardner Museum. And, um, and she seems almost unaware of our presence. Devastatingly elegant here. But of course, it created a huge uproar when it was exhibited because when it was first painted, Sargent had the strap, one strap of that dress falling over her shoulder. Now, this was just considered too much for audiences at the time. They could handle sexy, they could even handle nude, but this was considered really kind of crude and in poor taste. And it was considered right in line with how they thought of Americans. So poor Madame Gautreau was like, you know, trying to be as sophisticated and as elegant as she could be in Parisian society. And people were like, oh God, it's another crude American. American here. So she's devastated. Um, she's humiliated. And, and Sargent was too. So um, just to give you a sense in terms of how people understood this, this is really a dated reference, but I've got a photo here of um, Angelina Jolie. This is from the Oscars like 10 years ago now, but she was wearing a very similar dress to um, Madame X. And she made, uh, she was, she sort of became a joke the night of the Oscars because every time she posed, she um, would stick her bare leg out of this very high slit. She would pop a knee. And it was just so unnecessary because she's already so beautiful. She's already so um, like slender and elegant. And the dress was just so perfect. She didn't need to add that extra layer of sexuality to it. She's already there. And so it became a joke at the time for Angelina Jolie and certainly for Madame X at the time. Now, there were other criticisms as well. She was an unusual beauty. So in this little cartoon here, there's this idea of, you know, that her nose is too prominent, that the dress was sort of silly looking. Now, there were criticisms uh, uh, when it came to that strap and the dress in particular. One critic said, um, <laughs> one more struggle and the lady will be free. This idea that like, 
like the dress could just pop off at any moment, but of course not. It's like a corseted whalebone dress that she was wearing. Now she didn't take the painting. Sargent held on to it. He kept the painting for 36 years. Here he is in his studio painting alongside it. In 1916, he sold the painting to the MFA in Boston. And he said, I suppose, or no, sorry, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he said, I suppose it's the best thing I have ever done. Now, Madame Gautreau goes on to have several other artists paint her portraits in the in subsequent years. These artists um, probably wouldn't know their names off the top of your head, so I'm not even going to get into it. But I will just say, if I was her and I had the, you know, I had the pick of these three works to be remembered by, I think I'd want to go with this one too. I do think it's funny that another artist painted her with her strap falling off of her shoulder. One other controversial painting, portrait painting that we'll touch on is also uh, kind of close to home for anybody uh, watching from the greater Boston area. This is, of course, Isabella Stewart Gardner. Here she is in a photograph. Here she is in Sargent's painted portrait of her. She was nearly 50 years old when he painted this portrait. Sargent was in his early 30s. The year was 1888. Um, Isabella Stewart Gardner uh, really liked to control her appearance. Um, if she were alive today, I think she'd be using a lot of filters on her social media. So, um, so she liked to have her painted her portrait painted, but she shied away from the camera. So with this painting, I think Sargent once again sort of gave her a little bit of a glow up. We can zoom in here and see that you know her face does not look like the face of a 50-year-old woman necessarily. This was always really a fun portrait to talk about on tours because we talk about um one of the criticisms was it, this was considered an ostentatious display of wealth and children would find the rubies and the pearls. There's actually two rubies on her shoes as well. The dress was considered a little too au courant, but the big criticism of course was the fact that um, she's standing in front of this tapestry, a fragment of a tapestry that's in her collection. And it makes it her look as though she's a saint, as though she's a Madonna. In fact, she's a woman that lost her own child here. So here she is standing with her arms encircled and empty, but she still has that halo and maybe even a little bit of a crown over her head. It caused such a sensation and such a controversy that Isabella Stewart Gardner asked, well, her husband asked that this painting never be displayed publicly again for the rest of his life. She went beyond that and did not display this painting again publicly for the rest of her life. So it wasn't until I think, you know, the late 1920s that you could actually go into this room of the museum and see where she had set it up. Um, amongst all these Gothic and Byzantine uh, Madonnas <laughs> appropriately. So let's turn our attention now in our last few minutes to some of Sargent's major uh, major commissions. We've got another lovely lady here in a stunning dress. I love this kind of iridescent sleeve over here. This is Mrs. George Swinton from 1897. And Sargent with these major works would occasionally get into hot water too. Um, you probably know the story of what happened at the Boston Public Library. So the library was built by M McKim, Mead, and White, and it was all it was conceived from the get-go as sort of a palace for the people. Um, found, uh, and, and the building itself was was erected in 1895. So Sargent obviously didn't live in Boston, but he was was um, he spent nearly 30 years of his life working on a mural cycle for this building. Now, inside the building, it really does look like a palace. And there's various rooms that are um, decorated with ornaments, with, uh, I should say, murals from major artists. This uh, this grand staircase here has has murals from the artist uh, Puvi de Chavan. Um, up on the top floor, maybe the best spot, Sargent gets this room with this barrel vaulted arched ceiling here. And he decides that he's gonna make this space into his own little American Sistine Chapel. <laughs> so he's really thinking a lot about religion. He's thinking a lot about um, Michelangelo and, and as, a precedent, as a precedent. And, and he really creates a, a pretty stunning cycle of murals. This, just to give you a sense in terms of how he did this, he had the framework that was the right size in his studio in London. And then he could bring these paintings back to the US and install them very slowly over the course of three decades. Now, his painting is called um, 
um, the, the triumph of religion. And so what we see here in this particular panel, and uh, all of these panels are infused with like the gold relief uh, here, but um, here we have sort of this, the origin story of religion uh, going back to almost prehistory. We have an Egyptian pharaoh, we've got like an Assyrian king, and he's painting this all in the various styles of these different cultures kind of coming together. These paintings that he creates for the Boston Public Library are incredibly dense. They are incredibly complicated. This is a spandrel that goes above your head from one wall to another. And so as your eye is moving up this figure over here and you're recognizing arms and a body and a face um, and you get to the other wall, you realize that there's another figure here that's kind of integrated into it, but going in another direction, it's mind blowing. There's so many references here, but what gets Sargent into hot water? Oh, I just broke up those two elements there, but what gets Sargent into hot water here are um, these two paintings that are just over the staircase leading into this gallery. And you can see he got into so much hot water that he actually doesn't even finish the cycle of paintings. So over here, just beyond this lamppost, there is a painting that is essentially a pieta. We've got Mary over here with the dead Christ at her feet. It's simply called church. Mary looks um, otherworldly. She looks supernatural, certainly triumphant, right? Um, she is a monumental figure painted with the, that kind of heft that you see in the figures of the sister. Sistine Chapel ceiling. And um, just across from that, uh, Sargent paints a picture that he simply calls synagogue. And in this painting, we have um, this kind of massive female form. She's, she's uh, got a crown falling off of her head. She's got a blindfold over her eyes. Her scepter is broken and her tent is collapsing down on her. That certainly seems to be saying something about the church versus the synagogue or the Jewish faith. And so there was a major backlash against this. Um, one, one person actually threw ink at this painting. Uh, it, people, people thought of this as being really vile back in the 1920s. Um, in fact, the art critic Roger Fry wrote, perhaps no considerable painter was ever less gifted by nature for such an undertaking. Another, another critic said, as murals, I know of nothing less appropriate to their walls than his in the Boston Public Library. So, I mean, he was just ripped across the coals for this. He claimed he was just trying to refer, uh, reference uh, a Michelangelo painting here. He also claimed that this was intended to be benign, but it's really hard to, to see that um, through the, the imagery that he chose to use. One other major work that he did in the 1920s, well, 19, uh, 1919, that was very uh, uh, highly regarded and, and really celebrated was his painting called Gassed, inspired by his experiences um, during World War I, where he uh, worked briefly as a military artist. This painting is about 20 feet long. Here it is again. It's at the Royal Academy. Academy, or I'm sorry, it's at the Imperial War Museum in London, and it was voted the picture of the year by the Royal Academy of Arts when it was painted. And what we see here is a column of soldiers who have been gassed um, uh, by the use of, uh, or blinded really by the use of mustard gas. This is chemical warfare, and they are leading each other, the blind leading the blind towards a medical tent that is just outside of the frame of the canvas. We can see another column of soldiers doing the same thing and then just piles of bodies of soldier, wounded soldiers who are waiting to be seen or have been seen and are waiting for their next step in life. Look at this figure here who is blinded, whose knee is raised so high, who really has no sense of the space around him and how he's going to navigate through this life. It's a really compelling and heart-wrenching image about the human toll um, that this war had on so many. So uh, just with a few moments that we have left, we're going to breeze through watercolors. We've got another elegant lady in a beautiful dress. This is um, M Millicent Duchess of Sutherland from 1903. And we see that Sargent is really done with portrait painting. He wants to go off and have fun. He's done with, you know, entertaining all of these rich ladies that want to look their absolute best. So Sargent, like I said, he worked briefly as a military artist. He got really adept at moving around with a tiny easel and a 
and, you know, and watercolor paints. This is a caricature of him doing just that, a photograph of him doing it over here on the right. And so he spends um, the better portion of the last few decades of his life traveling as much as he could with his sort of chosen family, his group of friends. And we can see that he's just as good at watercolor as he is with oil painting. Watercolor, whenever I've tried it, I like I have no control over the medium. It is a sloppy, inky mess. It's just wet. <laughs> but we can see that he can sort of lay in these really controlled lines. He can lay in lighter colors um, around darker colors. There's an incredible uh, uh, control here and a wonderful sense of color. Look at how he sort of cross hatched the dress over here. This is Florida. This is Maine. He's traveling all around. And um, and capturing these different places using watercolor. Oftentimes he conveys his friends who are with him. These ladies are in the Alps, just in these, you know, piles of petticoats waiting for him to finish painting. Um, these are from uh, 1911. Uh, I love this painting from Corfu, Greece. It's just so simple. It's really about the shadows on this um, very simple uh, little piece of architecture, a shed really. But the way that they're painted, you know, these, these uh, magenta hues in here, the blue on the roof, it's just stunning. It's stunning. His ability to, uh, you know, to not just uh, uh, sort of infuse everyday life with these brilliant colors, but to make us pause and really appreciate something that's so simple here is just magnificent. He's really celebrated for his paintings of Venice and, you know, why wouldn't you want to paint the canals of Venice with watercolors? His ability to capture the flowing water in the canals is gorgeous. You can see he's done a little bit of preparatory work in terms of uh, laying in the architecture here, but it's really the way he captures the water that I think steals the show in these watercolors of Venice. Makes you want to go to Venice right now. One other boat painting that he did is just simply called White Ships from 1908. This is at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. And this is the painting. This is the watercolor that always gets me and just shows how confident he was as an artist. Look, like just follow one line with your eye and notice, I mean, he's just dragging that, that loaded brush um, across the, the watercolor paper here, lifts it, drops it, lifts it drops it brings um this this rope um uh, across the surface of the boat and into the water lifts it drops it lifts it drops that so gives us the suggestion of the of the reflection of light off of the water on the sides of the boats here but all that rigging i mean it's just sort of virtuoso paint handling here and of course the way he's rendered the water itself is amazing so let's wrap up very quickly with his legacy. We've got another beautiful woman. Look at the dress. <laughs> the dress is so over the top. And who has pearls <laughs> that are this long? This is um, Lady Helen uh, Vincent from 1904. She's in the Burlington or Birmingham Museum of Art. Now, Sargent, he, his portrait, or I'm sorry, his quote here says, um, I don't dig beneath the surface for things that don't appear before my own eyes. And this is really where things go wrong for him. He's giving us the beauty. It's a superficial beauty. We see it right up until the end. This portrait of Grace Elvina is from 1925. It's his last formal um, oil portrait. It's actually in my hometown museum where I'm, I'm broadcasting from right now in Manchester, New Hampshire at the Courier Museum. It looks like it's right out of Downton Abbey, right? She's so elegant. The pose always makes me feel like I should be sitting up a little bit straighter. She's got, you know, pearls for days. She's got all of these markings of this, the status of, of her family here, of her class. She's surrounded by all of this kind of Di diaphanous sh like chiffon or tool here it's hard to say but it's so out of step with what is happening in the art world and in the world in general 1925 you've got Picasso making um, abstract paintings like this you have Vasily Kandinsky making completely non-objective art you even have American artists like Edward Hopper who are creating things that um 
that refer to the, the modern circumstance, the modern existence. And this certainly seems like a throwback in comparison. So after Sargent dies in the mid 1920s, you have critics just tearing him apart. This is Lewis Mumford in the 1930s. And he says, Sargent remained to the end, an illustrator, the most adroit, appear, adroit appearance of workmanship, the most dashing uh, eye for effect cannot conceal the essential emptiness of Sargent's mind or the contemptuous and cynical superficiality of a certain part of ex his execution. Believe it or not, at mid-century 1950, you could buy a John Singer Sargent painting for $300. <laughs> his reputation was in the toilet. And things begin to change in the, in I would say the last quarter or so of the 20th century. This is Norman Rockwell giving us a painting called um, Picasso versus Sargent. Sargent here, of course, is still a throwback. Um, we've got a sense of the young modern woman looking at Picasso and, and you know, the older woman with her hair and curlers alongside her daughter, um, looking at, a, you know, a more traditional notion of, of um, femininity. And of course, this is Mrs. George Swinton that we saw before. But, um, you know, once we get to somebody like Andy Warhol, things really change because Andy Warhol is interested in the superficial. Um, he's interested in things that, you know, are, are, are just about beauty. He said, Sargent made everybody look glamorous, taller, thinner, but they all have a mood. Every one of them has a mood. You can sort of see it in this portrait of Miss Helen Dunham from 1892. Now, just to give you a sense in terms of where his reputation stands today, in terms of auction prices, we've got another version of Robert Louis Stevenson. This sold for about almost 10 million to the Crystal Bridges Museum. Um, and then over here, the group with parasols sold for close to 25 million, doubling the estimate from Sotheby's. That was in 2004. So um, in terms of audiences, though, I think people still eat this stuff up. I think if there was a major show of Sargent at the MFA today, people would be there in droves. We still love Sargent. And why do we love Sargent? Why did a million people turn out for that exhibition? So, so many people that the MFA actually had to stay open 24 hours a day during its final weekend. Um, critics today say that there's a reason we're interested in these pictures and why in today's society, we might be even more interested in them. This is a Sargent painting over here called An Interior in Venice from 1899. And yes, this is Ivanka Trump and her family. One critic, I think, put it in a really interesting way. She said, the appeal, nay the point of Sargent is beauty, extravagance, and the visual representation of social hierarchy. And there's so much about that, about um, those things in our culture today. It's sort of why we love to watch celebrities on TV. It's certainly part of, I, I think, Trump's appeal um, and certainly of what Ivanka is trying to um, conjure in a family portrait that looks like this. But to leave us on maybe more hopeful, maybe less cynical note, I would say that the appeal of John Singer Sargent's paintings is it's, it's fantasy. It is escapism. He created worlds that were completely completely devoid of work or strife or conflict. They were just beautiful. He tapped into ways of representing a world we all want to be a part of. And so this is his painting, Capri Girl on a Rooftop. I will leave you with her tonight. We can almost hear those castanets once again. I welcome any questions or comments you might have about John Singer Sargent. Thank you so much, Jane. My pleasure. I enjoyed John's, um, John Singer Sargent's work, but I didn't know about the controversy. So that was really, oh, yeah. that was, yeah, <laughs> that was really interesting. Okay, so um, are, there other, are there any questions? Oh, um, so somebody asked if you think he is gay. Maybe. I believe generally today, I think there's like an understanding that he probably was. Hmm. Um, it would, it, it's an easy and we easy way to understand why he never got married, but there's a lot of um, a lot of male nude studies, particularly of a model I think that was from Boston. I don't know that aspect of his biography um, too well, but I think they were done in preparation for the murals at the MFA in Boston, and um, 
done with so much attention to, and sensitivity that I think people have extrapolated from there that he was probably gay. The portrait of the sergeant is definitely, the gaze is interesting. And then another person asked, um, who did the white unpairing first, white, white painting first? Is it Whistler's or Sargent? Oh, it was Whistler. Whistler started the craze. <laughs> and, um, and then many other artists uh, fell in line. There's, uh, there's like a loosely Boston-based artist, a, a female artist named Cecilia Bow, who painted in very, a style very similar to John Singer Sargent. But she was famous for doing white on white paintings. But it was really Whistler who got it started over here with his little white girl. That was a sensational painting in its own right. People, the critics said she looked like a traumatized bride after her wedding night. <laughs> and then they got into how it was painted. Who <laughs> painted? <laughs> and then another question asked if he learned his art from study or from practice. His very early work looks flat but improves greatly in such a short time. Yeah. Oh, that's a good comment. Um, well, I mean, he received the best of the best when it came to training. He did go to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. He's also studying with Carolus Duran. He's getting, he's, and, and then he's just sort of absorbing everything as, as he's traveling around. So I think, you know, he's sitting there with Claude Monet painting on plein air and he goes, he's clearly going to museums throughout his entire life. So I think uh, he almost seems like somebody who continued to learn, even though he wasn't doing formal training after, um, after that edited, but it seemed like, uh, you know, with, with time and continued study, continued effort and practice, I mean, his work just continued to dazzle and improve. Yeah. And one more question, if um, I think this refers, and please let me know if I was wrong, but uh, I think this refers to the last painting, if the model was the model of black man. Oh, okay. For the girl uh, in Capri, that I'm not sure of. Um, I, I I would imagine she was probably Italian, but she does sort of have darker skin. Oh, sorry. Let's see here. Um, I I would say, oh, over here. Oh, I'm not sure. I, to be honest, I'm just not sure. Um, I'm sure that there was a little bit of of a note of like an exotic other in in painting even a composition that looked like this the subject the music um so so i you know i i can't say for certain um what ethnicity or race that the the, the people are but since it, it refers to capri i i just thought it was italian yeah. oh and um actually the commenter said um he's she's talking about his love interest um there was a black man who was a bellman so that i'm Oh, oh, yeah. Um, I, I think I know what you're talking about. I think that was the, um, the, the, the figure that he uh, <laughs> repeatedly um, sketched in preparation for the MFA murals. That, that was a black man that, that, um, that he seemed particularly interested in. <laughs> And those are the questions in the chat box. Um, are there anyone else who has questions? And I am going to actually stop the recording now.